Welcome to the Rich and Success Podcast, the podcast that aims to define exactly what success is to you and helps you implement this into your daily life. Hosted by cousins, actor, singer and multiple business owner Matt Hall and ex-rugby player, health, well-being and fitness coach Dan Ramsden. Join them on this exciting journey as they unravel the minds of their inspirational guests in a quest of self-discovery. Are you ready to take your life to the next level? If so, this is the podcast for you. Now let today's lesson begin. Welcome back everyone to this, the second ever episode of the Rich in Success podcast. Thank you so much for hitting play, for giving us a go today, for listening to us. Um, We're super excited. We have got Emmerdale veteran Mr. James Hooten, best veteran. known as... Did you like that veteran, I yeah? Know, you know, it describes me well, yeah, decrepit. <laughs> it sound really old. old. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, like I've been in the wars. I should yeah. have like a... I mean, I've got an injury anyway, so I should have like a... <laughs> but this is why I said it. I wasn't going to call yeah, you that, no, but I thought, yeah. No, you, I like it. Spot on. It fits the bill. <laughs> yeah, so best known to most people as playing Sam Dingle in Emmerdale. And Sam's been going through some tough, tough times. Oh. No, No less than... Losing Lisa Dingle, one of the he has, biggest indeed. characters. The matriarch What's that of been the like? show, yes. Yeah. Certainly the matriarch of the Dingle family. Um, it's, it's been great. It's been interesting. Obviously very sad. Um, Jane Cox, who played Lisa Dingle, was a good friend of mine. I worked, I did a play with her back in 1994 at the Bush Theatre down in London. Uh, before I'd even got the job. I started in 95 no on Emmerdale. Way, yeah. And um, she played my mum in a, in a show. So, you know, I got to know her really well there. And then for her to come into the show, and she's been in, involved with Emmerdale for like 23 years. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Off and on. Yeah. And she'd sort of had reasons to want to, to leave mm. and sort of maybe semi-retire, which she now has. And she was, she was based in Hebden Bridge for a while. She's sold her place, bought a lovely place up in Scotland, oh, came out of the show for a bit. And then I think she wanted to come back and sort of just revisit and sort of finish the story for her. So she came back and obviously um, the character dies quite quickly. She mm. comes in and so there's a big uh, sort of dingle wedding. And then uh, unfortunately she dies on her wedding day. So yeah, so it was, it was, it was quite a, an... You know, it's a really interesting story for her to play mm. and for the character to die, and it brought all the dingles together. And that was the ironic thing, wasn't it? The scenes before you're all like yeah, together, and that's right. For yeah, once, yeah. there wasn't the feuding going on, and then yeah, and so then, so sad. What's yeah. that like emotionally? You know, obviously having that detachment away from the character, the role that you play, and then going back to your own life. Do, do you yeah. get, is it hard to to make that separation and that emotional investment in it? It's, it's an interesting question. The, for, for some people, I think the, the, there is a difficulty in an overlap, particularly if you are constantly... There's, there's characters on the show like there are in any soap, like there are you know in films. If you've got a really, really uh, difficult story to portray uh, and there's lots of emotion involved, I think some people find it very, very difficult to switch that off at the end of the day yeah. and just go about their life. For me, it's always a case of I come into work, I get into work mode... And when I finish my job at the end of the working day, bang, I'm out of there. And that's so long, I, you know, I, I can't get out of there quick enough because mm. I want to get home and get on with my life. Yeah. And there's a real distinction there for me. And that line's very clear. As soon as I've finished playing a scene and it's the end of my working day, I get changed and I'm gone and I forget about it. Have you always been like that? Is that something, a skill you've had to develop um, over time? I, d- I don't know if it's a skill as such. And, and like I say, this for, for some people, I think there is a real overlap. And I think it, it's it's an obvious one because physiologically, if you're putting your, your body through trauma and mm. you're playing emotional scenes consistently, then your body is reacting yeah. consistently it's to that. It's a stress response, isn't it? That stress yeah. response, yeah, absolutely. So I, th- I think it, it can be very difficult to 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 have a, a, a line of, of switch off. I mean, I think for me, maybe I'm just quite fortunate in as much as, mm. you know, I, I, I know where my working life lies and where my home life lies. And I think that was something that I tried to work out quite a long time ago on the show. You mm. know, I, I wanted to spend as little time as possible outside of Emmerdale in particular. I mean, I've done other stuff, but ma- mainly, you know, Emmerdale's taken up the biggest part of my working life. Uh, I wanted to have a distinction where I didn't take my ho- my work home with me. And I mean, if it comes home with me, it comes home as little as possible. Mm. 
and that's sort of how I live my working life. Yeah, it's so important, and I think yeah. so many people must find that so difficult. It's really nice to hear that that you take that seriously, and you know that there has yeah. to be that cut off when when you're doing something that is emotional. What's is there a lot of support on set with the way that absolutely everybody around you works? You know, yeah. compared to just a normal, light-hearted scene. What's how yeah. does that sort of work? No, I mean p- people are generally quite sensitive to to emotional scenes, particularly your first assistant director who runs the show yeah. basically. Yeah. So on set, you've got the director that comes in and directs the actors, directs the cameras, tells you what the shots are going to be. But the first assistant is all important on a s- studio floor on something like Emmerdale because yeah. we've got a lot of work to get through every day. And they need to just command the crowd sort of thing. And that's Mm. actors and crew. So It's a big job, isn't it? It's a big job, yeah. yeah. And it takes a particular sort of person to do it. And the ones that are really good at it, you know, there's there's a few that spring to mind. Uh, There's a guy I was working with this morning, Ian Morley, fantastic first AD. Mm. And he controls everything that's going on. And he does it in a sensitive manner. So everyone knows where they stand. Mm. So, yeah, the, the usually people will, the first AD will, you know, keep get a quiet set for you if you're doing something that's emotional or more involved and um yeah they make the job as easy as possible for everyone to perform so it's a real team ethos i yeah. think at emmerdale which that's good that's works really well it's yeah. an ensemble well yeah. i've had the pleasure when i was a kid of doing like bits of uh, background work and yeah and i can vouch for that because i think especially if you're coming into a smaller role or something like that that's where you'd see the reality you know it's all well and good that the lead actors coming on tv going oh we're all supportive and, yeah. and it's a lovely family and you do obviously hear that from from a lot of the tv shows but yeah. when you're coming in i it's one of the first things you realize it doesn't matter who you are you, yeah. you feel looked after and and it's it's a really nice environment and i just i think that's so important when you're dealing with some really sensitive subjects yeah. that you have that. I mean, you talk there about how much you have to get done in a day just to give people an idea what what sort of, the, what, what is the, the work is. rate yeah, um, that you're doing in a day? So I'll sort of break it down. So over a two week period, we'll film, we'll film 12 episodes because you know there's 12 episodes on screen over that wow. two, two week period. So it is a lot of volume in comparison to shooting on a film on a film set, you probably you'd be lucky if you're getting two to three minutes, or maybe up to six or seven minutes a day. I don't think you get that much. Two to three minutes a day, probably on a, mm. on a film set. Whereas we are well, at one time we were filming up to about twenty minutes a day, right? Which is it's like an episode. almost an episode. It's twenty-three yeah. minute show. Yeah. Um, the the scheduling department went through a long, prolonged change to make things run more efficiently for us when we, we went up to five and six apps a week. Mm. So now we do film less episodes. So I, I couldn't really put a, I mean, we, we probably on, on location, you, you film between six and eight scenes and in the studio, you can film up to 12 or 13 scenes. You can certainly get a lot more done with mm. the multi-camera studio yeah. setting. And uh, how many takes are you looking at getting? Because I, I know with soap, it's so quick that... It is pretty quick. Yeah. Are you looking at literally a couple of takes and then that's it, it's done? It can be, yeah. So yeah. You, usually you'll have a wide establishing shot and then you know you might play the whole scene on the beginning of the scene on that. Then you'll cut into um, to other group shots or singles and you, know, you might have close-ups after that. So you'll have two or three runs of the scene um, and inevitably things go wrong. So you might have to go again yeah. for either the actors messing up, usually me, <laughs> or, uh, or you know the crew like a boom dipping into shot or something like yeah, that but, yeah, yeah. Right. but the, it's it's relentless so they they have a schedule to get through and most of the time nine times out of ten we get through that well right. 99 times out of 100 we get through our working That's day I guess it's a well oiled machine now you know mm-hmm. running efficiently Absolutely. It, obviously it has such to a big, yeah because yeah. I, I think um, that's you know and that's what keeps the costs of the show down as well mm-hmm. they sort of try and run to schedule and to time and to yeah. Yeah. you know to budget as much as is humanly possible what's that like especially when you're going through quite a big storyline what's that like that volume of learning lines do you do you find learning lines easy is um, that I, I, I have a particular way of doing it. Um, I'd have to put it into perspective now. This might be really boring for you. but No, um, this is a good tip for actors, okay. though. So yeah. this is well, for me, this, uh, this is just my perspective on it. Of course. I, my, the character I play went through a very lean period of several years, you know, I'm talking 10, 15 years ago. And um, it, it got to the stage where I was starting to dislike my job 
because I, I wasn't getting very much to do and I was still young and ambitious. I wanted to do more work. Mm. And that's part of the reason why I've sort of left and come back to the show a few times. And at the time I went and had a meeting with the, the then producer and said, you know, is there, is there a chance of me getting involved in more story? And t- t- to put it bluntly, but he pretty much said, is there fuck? <laughs> no, and he didn't say that. You may as well have done. You may as well have done. Yeah, he's, yeah. He's, he's left me under no doubt that, you know, I, I wasn't going to be a character that was driving story in the show, right. which was fine. So then for me, my choice was, do I go and search elsewhere for, for more work um, and more challenges, or do I try and find ways of making my working life easier? So I thought, well, I'm going to stay with the show but I'll try and make my working life easier. So that was when, you know, I was sort of mentioning it to you guys before, I decided to take my home, my, my work home with me as little as possible and do all of my work on set. So now when I've got heavy dialogue scenes to learn, I'll tend to sort of get them in story order and have a look at them. And if I think that I can spend my time constructively on set, learning them and getting what I need to get out of the scene from my point of view. Mm. I'll just do that. I'll set those aside. You can leave it there then, that's it. And the ones that I need to, you know, if they've got lots of speeches in them, then I'll I'll take the requisite time to to get on on board with, you know, what's happening in that scene and try and get an overview of that dialogue so that that's in my head. Yeah. But for the majority of scenes, and if if you go down that route of training your brain to think that way, you tend to be able to do it because you, you, you know, neuroplasticity takes hold at some point yeah. and you form new habits. Yeah. Um, so I've formed a habit of being able to sort of learn my lines on set and not do, do so much at home unless completely well, That's necessary. great advice to people in general in the working life, you know. It it's all about to, forming it's habits. It's not just related yeah. to actors, it's, it's related to anybody in any sort of business, you know, yeah. what are you doing with your time if you get the odd 10 minutes here and 15 minutes there. Yeah. Some people end up just scrolling through the phones, etc. Whereas you could be getting those little bits of snippets of productivity in throughout your day. And then Absolutely. you can leave the, the work, leave yeah. it there, go home, enjoy the rest of your evening or whatever it is that you want to do. And don't get me wrong, that does put you in a position of, um, it's quite a heightened sort of, it heightens your stress levels to an extent if you're going to work that way. Because you know that everyone else is relying on you to do your job. My job is get lines out in correct order, try and get some kind of emotional sort of element into the scenes if needed and do right by my fellow artists. Mm, yeah. And that's what I try to do, but it puts the pressure on you to do it on set. So you find yourself having less sort of jokey, messing about conversations because you're constantly thinking about, right, let's you know get my moves right, my words right, make sure I know what I'm saying. And, um, you know touch wood that that works well for me mm. i don't think it would work for for everybody because it's it, it adds a pressure that wouldn't ordinarily be there yeah. but that's that's how i prefer to work so it means that i can come home and not have to get my head into the books again you know and looking at scripts yeah. for a couple of hours yeah, of a course. night so yeah it's like you say that's a really good tip for anybody like time management <laughs> we always say it but time is your, your most valuable it's resource. It's the only valuable resource, mm. yeah. The, the one certainty in life is we're going to run out of time. You know, no one gets off this planet alive, do they? Mm. So I don't know, we're trying. We're trying to figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> well, we that's, a, that's what Dave Asprey's trying to do, isn't it? Yeah. Have you heard of Dave Asprey, the Bulletproof exec guy? Oh, uh, right, okay. Behind, the guy behind Bulletproof Coffee. Yeah. He's oh, like yeah, a yeah, self-confessed yeah. biohacker. He spent millions of dollars trying to hack his own biology, and he wants to live to like 200 years old or something like that. Oh, my God. So we he's need trying to, try and to do it. Yeah. <laughs> he needs to get him here. <laughs> you need to get any him contacts. Yeah. Like, he's awesome, yeah. I mean, he sounds yeah, great. I've listened to it. He's, I think he does has a podcast show, actually. I've listened to some of his stuff. Very, very interesting. Right, okay. Yeah. Don't, don't plug other podcast what? shows. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not as it's good not as this. <laughs> it's not as good as this, though, that's is it? That's, that's what, what I find really interesting is, obviously, the, 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 the acting that you do and the, the character that you play, and it's so different from who you are. You yeah. know, you, you Thank are you. intelligent, articulate, and, you know... And it's, it's very s- kind of you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, well, not, I've not paid him no, to it's, say it's, it. It's, it is the truth. It's just my observations. It's very, very kind. But, yeah, it's just... Um, it's quite a, a funny thing that you, you you saw, you know, in wide range of who you actually are as a person to, to who you play on a daily basis. Well, but and we all have that, don't we? Of your working life has been like that. Yeah, but we all, um, we're all we're all multifaceted individuals. We've all got different tastes, different likes, dislikes. You know, mm-hmm. and yeah, you you could level an argument that that 
the, the some people in soaps aren't playing necessarily far away from themselves characters, but they're all playing characters, yeah. and we're all playing versions or aspects of ourselves in in our in the characters that we portray as well. So mm, yeah. there's a, there's you know. This, like Kane Dingle doesn't go around battering people yeah. all the time. He's a really nice sort of <clears throat> Jeff who plays the character. He's a very nice, polite family guy, you know, offset. But he goes around gripping people all the time yeah. in the show. Yeah. So he's, is it is it generally well received by people? Are people shocked when they actually meet you in in person? Um, I, I bit... get di- I get different reactions. Some sometimes people say. I, I, this, people say I sound posh quite a lot, which I don't think I do because I'm from Nottingham. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In, you know, pretty much inner city Nottingham, and I don't think anyone I know speaks posh. But I get that levelled at me quite a bit, and they say, "Yeah, you sound different." And I think some sometimes people are surprised that I can hold a conversation with them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but overwhelmingly, when people come up, that you know, generally it's 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 really nice, and yeah. people are, are quite polite, and you know, you can have a nice sort of conversation with them and yeah. and away we go on our lives you know and it's, that's how we we should be with people isn't it we try and be as polite and forthcoming with people as we can on this journey yeah. mm-hmm. on that though there is an element of pressure I guess to, to be to be a certain way and, and to be um, you know open to people approaching you and, and things like that and there is and obviously there's going to be still down days and dark times in everybody's life absolutely and yeah. is, you know, is that is that something that you've ever struggled with? You know, like to put on this this show when sometimes you know, like um, to be pleasant in front of people when they're coming up to you, approaching you, etc. I think the thing for me is because I wear, I mean I, I wear glasses in real life, and you know, if I'm not working, I grow a beard, and I think I look a little bit different from from my character. So sometimes I don't I, I can retain a certain level of anonymity. Okay. I can go down mm. the shops and not get accosted by people. You know. But if I do, it's, it's like I say, the feedback's generally really nice. So it's not, doesn't pose a problem for me. I think there's other people, there's certainly people I know really well on the show that um, struggle with going out in public and wanting to have private time or enjoy themselves mm. and not have people come up to them all the time. They struggle with that fact that they have zero anonymity. And I can understand it to an extent, but also it's a real double-edged sword because yeah. we, we get paid reasonably well for, for what we do. I mean, it's not life-shaking money, but we get reasonably well paid. So the least that I think is expected of us in public life is to try and give people the time of day if they come up and want a selfie with you. Or, mm, yeah. You know, I, I think it's, it's, it, doesn't, it doesn't take much to do that. No, it doesn't. And it's som- it, sometimes it, it, it can appear quite rude because they were interrupting some you know family time or time with friends when you're in the middle of a conversation and people want something from you immediately mm-hmm. but as long as they're polite about it i don't have a problem and it's you know i it's very very seldom that i would not um be um, willing to, to to speak to someone if they come up and say loving what you do can I have a selfie you know there's been like once in an airport when i'm feeding my newborn baby and someone wants me to come and have a selfie with myself sorry mate i'm just feeding baby at the time i think yeah. that's the only time i've yeah. sort of refused to do that but yeah. i think it's it's part of our job to mm. put on a, a public persona that is amenable and to give people the time of day i think it's it's only reasonable to do that i suppose it just comes down to being grateful for the job you've got and recognizing it's part of the package of that sort of it's job. It's not about it? this. It's not just about this job, though, is it? It's any job, any any walk of life. Mm. You know, there's no reason why. You know, if you're if you're working for a company, there's no reason why your CEO shouldn't come down onto the shop floor and be polite and amiable with. Absolutely. Yeah. Is work? Why the hell not? Well, mm. We should, because status is a fiction. You know, any 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 perceived status. We're all living, breathing, sentient beings. That's how I like to use that phrase. I don't really know what I mean when I say that. <laughs> <It sounds laughs> I like it. it. <laughs> like it. Well, we're living, that. breathing, sentient beings. You know, we're bio <laughs> bioelectrical organisms, and we have the ability to be nice or nasty to everyone who we come across. It's a choice. Yeah. So it's a, cho- yeah. it's a it's a choice, and I think the more positive an outlook people have on life, the the more they are likely to be positive with each other. Mm. We have a lot to be negative about, and sometimes negativity can override people's circuitry, I suppose, and mm. they become, you know, 
that can be a breeding ground, whatever it is, yeah. it can manifest. Yeah. I think it's making the the right decisions to put yourself in the situations of the life that you want to live. You absolutely, know? yeah. And no, it's the, absolutely nail on the head. Yeah, not be surrounded by the, the other bits of negativity that can yeah. lower your state of consciousness and, you know, lower your, your mood and, and everything else. So yeah. it's making those daily decisions to stay on point with the life that you want to live, I think. It is, and so. it is a daily thing because, you, you know, we can all... Yeah. We can all find ourselves in in circumstances and situations that are not productive or you know the, the problem causing situations and it's we have to try and manage those as best we can and sometimes things don't work out as we would like them to but mm. as long as we're, we're trying to do that through yeah. life it's something we talk about a lot isn't it that it take away the element of trying to control the situation and the circumstance the only thing you have control over is how you respond and if you yeah. can constantly work on practicing better responses that's how ultimately you're going to find that you're just happier in general, aren't you, in, in, in life, mm. you know, because I think people just get so programmed to respond in negatively that it's just normal. Like, yeah. they, they, you know, uh, it becomes normalized by habit. And yeah. by, I mean, we have two really overriding elements in our lives, don't we have the nature and the nurture element. Yeah. So, you know, the, the nurturing of our family is one thing we perhaps as, as young beings, we don't have as much control over, you know, we're sucking in information, but... Our, uh, our our nature, the environments that we're in, the people that we we choose to spend time with, we've got as we get older, and hopefully you know we get a bit of something about us that we we change our environments or the people that we're with. If we're with people or in environments that are stress inducing or yeah. negative or not helping us get on a path to an enlightened or a positive life, mm. yeah. Do you have any sort of daily rituals or strategies for health well-being mindfulness any anything that you do um, you know, that may help people that that you've got advice on i'm very i'm very interested in the, the spiritual life i know very little about it about the metaphysical and the spiritual life I, I have reason to believe that there may be something beyond this material existence i think life is eternal in nature i'm not a religious person but there's people whose perspectives I really, I really like, and uh, there's a guy called Bruce Lipton actually, who was a cellular biologist, and he talks about life um, as it's like, say for instance, we're in this room, we've got a radio transmitter, and we want to want to tune into radio one, so you tune that radio set into radio one, and that radio signal is there, and immediately you get radio one. Yeah. Well, he he sees human life or material existence in the same way that okay, there is yeah. and, and he describes it from a from a biological perspective which I, I really like whether there's credence to the biology that he puts forward is another matter but mm. I love what he puts forward and his, his suggestion is similar to that radio set we we are the, we're like the radio set and there is there is a, um, a wavelength frequency that that comes in and codes for proteins and it's as if the personality is beamed into the um, the material being, the human body. Mm. And I think, wow, that sounds like a fascinating idea. Yeah, I'm open to considering whether that's true or not. And you know, and uh, he says that after the material body dies, that radio signal is still there, and it it, it operates on the same frequent wavelength frequency as the body does. So the the wavelength frequency of the signal comes into the body and when when the body dies that signal is still there and it's ready to a, attach to another body i think there's a whole you know that blows my mind to consider that as a concept uh but i have i have no reason to disbelieve it or to believe it but i like i have reason to believe it yeah yeah well, so that's great. You know, i, I like being open to that isn't but it? i'm open to thinking yeah. that yeah. that's the way things are you yeah. know and maybe they're not but I'm, I'm open to considering that as yeah. a possibility I think that probably leads us down a happier life as well because there's there is faith if, if you don't have religion i think it gives yeah. you it gives you that faith that it's not it's not necessarily over when well, it's so certainly this is a, I th I th it feels as though this is a one hit deal for this ego this personality that we all inhabit yeah and it seems as though you know that may well dissolve once once we pass away but the idea that the the things that created that 
that personality still exists is a, is an interesting it is, uh, yeah, concept. Definitely. I love that. How is that for a three a.m. in the morning chat? We're yeah, going there. We're, we're doing it like now. We've yeah. got a couple of beers. Past two in the afternoon. Yeah. <laughs> with water. Oh yes. Oh god. Yeah. Can you imagine? <laughs> two in the morning, we would get deep on <laughs> subjects like this. That's it. Let's do it. Well, well, just to just to take us back to the show for a second as well. I mm. think one thing that's always impressed me is the importance of getting storylines right in mm-hmm. the sense that a lot of, if not everything that you explore on Emmerdale, obviously is things that people are going through in real life. Um, yeah. One of the things to note for me, I mean, you've had some some huge storylines. There was the, the abuse storyline with the character Rachel. And one thing that stands out in my memory is the death of Sam's wife, Alice. Oh, Alice, yeah, that's and some years ago. It, well... I believe yeah. it was 2006, and the was reason indeed, he's done his research. Uh, yeah, done it, done it. Well, actually, <laughs> the, the the reason is it's the same year that that Dan lost his mum, and I right. and yes, that obviously course. lost Sorry. my auntie. So it it's it's weird, but I think if if you're relevant. going through something like that, and it's yeah, and it's relevant, and yeah. it's done poorly, you know, you you're gonna be kind of a little bit pissed off that you're like, hang on, that is not how this works. But I genuinely remember the death of Alice which yeah. is a fictional character like a real person passing. Mm-hmm. And that is as a result of, you know, the, the depth you went to in creating a realistic situation, I guess. Wow. Is, is, that, is that something you feel a huge amount of pressure? Um, are you aware of it or do you have to just let it go and just be as... You, you're aware of it to the extent that... And thank you for, for saying that that sort of... I mean, that was that was quite a poignant story for, 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 for me personally at the time because it was quite a large responsibility that's bestowed on us to try and get it right. Of course, yeah. Of and course. Ursula Holden Gill, who played um, at the character of Alice, she did loads of research into non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, which is what the character had yeah. at the time. Amazing, as, as were you. She, went, you know, she went as far as to you know, shave, shave all her hair off and stuff, and she tried to portray it as mm. realistically as was possible for a, a seven o'clock soap. Yeah. Um, yeah. And yeah, I, I mean, from an, act, from an actor's point of view, you get presented with a script. I mean, we've had some quite emotional stuff recently as well, and you get presented with these scripts. And it's what we're there for. We want to try and portray pathos or re- you know realistic emotional storylines and structures um and we want to entertain an audience but we want to try and if 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 we've got something that's quite a uh, poignant subject matter we want to try and do it to the best of our ability in that time slot mm. we're not a drama we're not a film mm. we can't we're not afforded the amount of time and the amount of script edits that you would get on those sort of vehicles. But you are on every night as well, though. And we're so on every night. You live in it as an audience It's member. a massive turnover of story, mm. obviously. And we just all try to do our best to mm. make it as authentic as it can be in those <clears throat> emotional stories, you know. Mm, of course. Sometimes it really works well and, and other times not so well, but, you know, we just we keep trying to do it to the best of our abilities, all of us. Mm. Well, I want to ask James, I know we're going a little bit off topic here for this particular part, but I think it's really important for the listeners to know health and well-being and fitness. You know, yeah. you're a fit guy. I've seen pictures of you. Jeez. Yeah, but that picture, that picture of oh. me looked a lot better than I actually am. I'm a skinny, less than 12 stone guy. But, <laughs> I, you know, I'd literally been at the climbing wall for three hours. So a load pumped. of pull-ups, sit-ups. There was there was blood in the guns. <laughs> I love that. But I, I am, you know, I'm not, I'm not a weight trainer. I'm not a big guy, but I, I only posted that picture because I took it and I thought, God, I look good. <laughs> People need to see this. <laughs> is that, is that your thing then? Is it climbing predominantly? Climbing is my thing. So the thing about climbing is it's all strength to weight ratio. Yeah. So, you know, you don't, it's not like, um, and I know you, you, you guys, I can see you've got some decent guns on you guys. You know, you're doing well there. Swans. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um, for me, it's, it's, uh, if I'm training, it's not about um, hypertrophy of the muscles. It's just about recruiting more fibers for the size of muscle that you've got and incremental increases in finger strength mm. and yeah, forearm and tendon cra- strength. It's crazy how strong climbers are with that. Climbers are fantastically it, strong. At the highest level, they're just, just hooking, unbelievable. Hooking some tiny yeah, I mean, finger if you've, tips. If you've ever seen Shauna Coxey, who's like, she's British uh, elite climber, world champion climber, and hopefully she'll be competing in the Olympics, you know, next time around. But you see someone like that climb, and it's just so balletic and elegant, 
and it looks effortless. often looks so effortless yeah. it's unbelievable and then you try and do some of the things that they're doing and it's just in, mm, yeah. nigh impossible yeah. Certainly I've, I've when you, tried to climb and, it, and it's very very difficult well it's bouldering just a, as well yeah bouldering yeah. it's just a particular type of climbing so it's it's short powerful routes over sh- a short distance yeah. and it's like anything you know you you i mean your physique and your your fitness will lend itself towards learning those skill sets quicker because you're in good shape but still you've got that the finger strength to develop and the you know the ten, the tendons are used in a very particular way when you're yeah. climbing mm. it's the forearms that, that give in for yeah me. For, forearm endurance I'm not, I'm not, is a massive not thing not used to that yeah. lactic acid yeah what was I, it that got what, what was it that you that got you into climbing was it something um, you was always intrigued by absolutely yeah and before parkour existed and all that yeah. sort of thing i was one of those guys as a kid who was climbing on school roofs and jumping off yeah, stuff yeah. and Love jumping that. over things and yeah. getting stuck up trees like an idiot you know when i was a kid playing football on the park and then i missed an hour of football because i'd climbed up a tree and <laughs> i couldn't get back down so i was one of those dickheads that was always maybe go- going a bit further than I should have done considering my skill sets yeah because I didn't have yeah, the yeah. skills yeah um so yeah I tried climbing 20 odd years ago loved it but as you were saying about the forearm burn I'd done a couple of sessions my forearms were completely paggered yeah and I couldn't do anything I thought oh, I'll give myself a few weeks and I'll go back mm. never went back and then fast forward to it was about 10 years ago I started climbing and there was a actor on the show called Joe Gilgan who used mm. to play Eli Dingle. Yeah, what a legend that guy legend, is. Legend, yeah. absolutely. Great smashed it in films since he left. Yeah. You know, yeah. he's, he's doing so well. Yeah. Absolutely, his career's gone like that. Um, and he was living near Stanningley and a climbing wall called The Depot mm. opened on Richard Shaw Lane. And he said, do you fancy coming along? And I, I was like, yeah, yeah, let's give it another go. I loved it last time. And I've been absolutely hooked on it since. Really? And I really regret not keeping up with it. Yeah when I tried it before. Don't you think that's so important though for, for anybody? It's Obviously it's important that we all try and keep fit. Yes. That you find the thing that you actually love to do it's and the, you get fit by default. It's that's... the only thing that keeps you yeah. doing it. Mm. Yeah. Week after week, month after mm. month, year after year is enjoying what you're doing. You've so got to find something that, that you that, enjoy. Exactly. So many people that I work with, they're, they're putting an enormous amount of pressure on themselves. To, yeah. They want to look a certain way or they want to do the most efficient type of training for a certain look or whatever it is right. but they're never going to stick it out because the the goals are, are all wrong yeah and, and it's just and, and i always say you've got to find that thing that that lights you up that's what the first is it that thing. you want yeah. to do mm. that's what the do you first enjoy? thing it's the essential because that it does it's lighting up parts of your brain yeah. and you you're thinking about it i mean I, I remember i did karate for a couple of years when i was a teenager and my sensei sensei oliver um, he used to say he was so hooked on what he was teaching in his day job. He was walking around the office doing wrist locks and yeah, you know, yeah, he, he yeah. just couldn't stop doing stuff. Yeah. 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 And, you know, I, when I first started climbing, I was like that. I was getting all these little finger grippers and I'm walking around work. People are going, what are you doing? I'm working on my finger strength. <laughs> <laughs> all the time. Yeah. Yeah. And People think you've completely lost it. Yeah. Just <laughs> and that, that passion has never subsided for That's me brilliant. with climbing. Mm. And it's the, the only thing it's comparable to is football. And I used to love to play competitive football, never at a particularly high standard. You know, I'd never reached semi-pro even, but I, I used to play on a Saturday afternoon, s- decent standard. Mm. Used to love it and Sunday mornings. And I played competitively until my body started to give up. Mm. And I still play now, you know, Ash. I watch him bang the goals ooh, in, ooh. you know. Ooh. Yeah, you, so um, you do it a lot for charity there, don't you? Is that I, play, I play charity matches. Yeah. I enjoy them because they're less competitive than, you know, playing, playing league matches every weekend. Mm. You get less people flying into tackles and particularly if they recognise you off the telly, sometimes they might want to smash it into pieces. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Nobody needs that. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, I enjoy I enjoy playing charity matches. It's but a in great that way great, to keep again, playing. you're you're doing something there that's that's benefiting others. It's, it's benefiting whammy, the charity, yeah, yeah. but yeah. you're getting your your joy as well. Yeah, again. I still I still I still love playing. So mm. it's a joy for me to turn out. I play for a team called Supporting Charities, Bradford-based um, charity football team run by Chris Morley, and I I love 
playing with those boys who are a lot younger and fitter than me. Yeah. And this, you know, I can't sprint like I once did, but I can still do a job and be part of a team. And mm. it's a nice ethos being, you know, part of a team and they're a winning team as well. So mm. all the better. We won like a, won an 11 aside tournament like, yeah. the other month. And I was like, <laughs> never thought I'd win any more silverware. But yeah, yeah so it's all, well, it's that's continuity. That's keep you young, of, isn't it? And yeah, enjoying what you do and sticking at it. And it's a, a lifetime pursuit. Certainly climbing for me mm. is a lifetime pursuit. As so, long as I can do it, I will continue to do it. Yeah, that's brilliant. Anybody listening, please take that on board. You've got to do something that you love, something that you enjoy, something Find that you're going to stick to. that thing that turns your lights on, yeah. Because yeah. there's no point in, in just thinking, oh, I've got to get fit, I've got to look like this. If you're not enjoying the, the actual doing of the pursuit, you need to enjoy the pursuit for it to have longevity. 100%. If it's just about image, it's completely short-lived, isn't it? Like, yeah. you look good for that photo, but what about... You yeah. know, the rest of that day. It's not fulfilling you, though either. It's easy no. to fall off, isn't it? Yeah. It's a little bit like when we talk about in general going for goals that are based on money or fame or anything like that. They, when we talk to people that have had those things, the nine times out of ten, the thing they tell you is that's not where happiness lies. So if you put it's all not. your energy in that, you know, you're gonna end up really unhappy. And another point to uh, on the happiness thing, I love the perspective of a guy called <clears throat> Jordan Peterson. I don't know if you've come across him. He's a, a Toronto. He's, he's a um, professor of psychology at Toronto University, and he does. He's going around doing lots and lots of speeches all over the world, motivational speeches, and he talks about. He, he says lots of things that I absolutely agree with massively, and one of those things is about it's about that happiness thing, and what he says is, rather than set out, you know, I want to be happy in life, what he talks about is having meaning in your life and taking responsibility. So he says, you've got to pick up your responsibilities and you find meaning through picking up your responsibilities in life, whatever they are. Mm. Responsibilities to your friends, to your family, to, to people in your you know, working life. Mm. We have the responsibility to try and do our jobs the best we can, try and be reasonable human beings that aren't going around causing problems for people, and to look after our families and ourselves. It's, that's part of it, is looking after yourself. Mm. One of the things he says in his book, 12 rules for life is um, clean up your room. You know, some people might have world views. If I was a world leader, I would lead the world so well. And all this is Jordan Peterson talks about all this. And he says, well, why don't you start a little bit smaller than that? You know, to start with how tidy is your room? How, you know, how tidy is your house? How well are you looking after your brain and body and your development as a human being? How well are you looking after your family? Mm. And, you know, if you can get those elements of your life almost, in order, yeah. yeah, then maybe start trying to branch out a little bit further and mm. maybe become prime minister one day. But, you know, start, yeah. you've got to start with the most small incremental thing. And yeah, I, I happen to disagree with Jordan Peterson to an extent about, you know, happiness isn't something to strive for. Because I actually think that we're here for the expansion of happiness. I think that's part of our existence is to try and expand happiness mm. in our own lives and other people's lives if we can. Yeah, yeah agreed. Yeah. But I love what he says and I think I mean, picking up your responsibilities and, and finding meaning through that in life is a, a massive thing to do. I think it's just, just right. Mm. Yeah. And happiness is now as well. Yeah, and it's that, not. You know, it's yeah, not it's, over it's, there and it's not established when I get elsewhere. there yeah. and, and things yeah. like when that. When I do but this, yeah. I'll be happy. Yeah. yeah. When I've been there, I'll be yeah. happy. It's yeah. be, do, have, isn't it? It's mm. be happy, do what you're doing and have, you know, yeah. the, the fruits of your labour. Not yeah. just being like, oh, when we go to a beefer, we're going to have a great time. It's like, well, yeah. that's in six months. <laughs> you're just going to be miserable for six months until you get to Ibiza yeah, for a week. Exactly. <laughs> and be miserable again. Yeah. But we put, yeah, a lot, put a lot of emphasis on those things, don't we? Completely. Instead of Absolutely. looking at the here and now, mm. and there is only the now. That's another thing. Eckhart Tolle, have you heard of... Mm. Eckhart Tolle wrote a book called The Power of Now. Yeah, I've heard of that book, yeah. yeah. He talks in that book. I mean, I mean I've heard him lecturing and, and he says something so profound. He says, like, even if you could time travel into the past or the future, you would still be in the now because that's the only actual yeah. place you can exist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So All you've got build, is now. Build your life around the now. Mm. 100%, yeah. yeah. I love that. For... Um, for you, obviously, you spent a long career in Emmerdale, Pache yeah. and Sam, and the I think one of the reasons he's so successful as a character is that people can relate to him. Everybody knows a Sam. He's, you know, he's the underdog. 
He's the he, mm-hmm. he's the joker. He's he's funny, um, but also he's taken for granted a lot, isn't he? That that that's one of the things. And I think we were speaking out about this before. There's a lot of Sams out there. Yeah. What what sort of attributes would you would you like to give to Sam and, and vice versa for yourself as well? What attributes of Sam do you think are really good that you wish um, you could have a little bit more in your own life? Well, my missus definitely th- wishes I was more like Sam in my real life because she, she could tell me what to do more easily, I think. If, <laughs> oh, okay. If I was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. But no, I, I think, yeah, he, I think he's, a, he's, a, he's, a, he's a loving and family-orientated character and I mm. love that. I love portraying someone who is, who is... And I love playing characters as well. I like to as an actor play something that that is you know away from my comfort zone to an extent and you know putting on a different persona mm. you know it's like dressing up as a kid it's of course, like, yeah it, it appeals to me um and uh, sorry what was what was your question again what, what about, attributes would would you like to give to sam because yeah, well, there's the real sams out there around ha- the world he has the character has changed quite significantly from the early de- early days, and they they write for the, the writers write for the character differently now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think they tried to establish more, um, a little bit more assertiveness mm. in him as he gets older, and as his father figure, the patriarch of the family, Zach, becomes you know older. And I think there's a there's a sense that Sam has played stories where he's had to step up to the mark, sort of thing. He's yeah. not necessarily as geared up to doing that as other characters are. And it's, you know, seeing whether he can succeed in getting through those stories at and times. Having the courage and, to... And the courage and, and being supportive. Mm. And I think it's important that those sort of characters are um, utilised in soaps mm. because they can they can show people's um, d- development and and show people that there are way for, ways through things. Even if, you know, Sam's, the character of, of Sam has sort of... is recognized as his family as being a bit slow or he Mm. has learning difficulties Mm. but um you know that's not to say that he can't take responsibility for himself and others around him Mm. and i think the the writers do a really good job of portraying the character and and allowing those expressions of you know his his ability Mm. to to come out and um yeah we've just been doing a recent story it's just been on the box where um the character of lydia has sort of um she, she confesses that she she'd had a, a baby when she was 15 and she was in care at the time and the baby died on at birth mm. and she buried it and didn't tell anyone about it and it's all sort of come to light recently and and we've seen a, a different side of the character of sam he's, he's had to be supportive and understanding mm. and nurturing of his, his of his betrothed you know his mm. of his fiance who he loves desperately you know and wants to marry and She's going through this massive trauma, and he just he needs to be there for her and to try and understand what she's going through. Mm. And I think those aspects of soap, when they portray right, and mm. I think the writing's been really good. It's yeah. been interesting to play. Hopefully, I mean, it has been quite well received from all in you know, the yeah. So it's it's and it's nice. And I think those elements sit well in a, in in soapland because there's going to be lots of destruction, murder, mm. violence, mm. fraud. All the soaps are beset by having to create drama mm. and create those stories. So it's nice to get a little bit of light and shade and balance of people caring and looking yeah, after each other and getting yeah. over things. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think that's essential. Mm. On on that, um, we just want to have a little bit of, bit of fun with this. So go on. Because you've played Sam like for fifty percent of your life, pretty much. It is, yeah. Much. You know more him. Than 50% you, you, of my know, life. you know him better than better than anybody. And mm. we, we want to do a quick fire <clears throat> thing. So, okay, does this relate to Sam or James? Okay, so or we're both. gonna play Sam <laughs> or James. <laughs> yeah, well, it's <laughs> kind of <laughs> there. It is. There it is. We don't even need to do a thing. That was perfect. <laughs> um, it's who it applies more to. So the first one we've got. Okay, is it Sam or James? Who is the most confident? Um, I would say James is more confident than Sam. I would definitely agree with that. Yeah. Most loving. I would say. That's a tough one. I would say both. I think you know. I try to be loving in my personal life as much as I, I can. Maybe Sam gets it right more times than James gets it right, but I would say both. Mm. Good answer. Uh, who? Who do you think has the worst habits, more bad habits? Definitely 
definitely me. <laughs> Can you share some of them? No, I, I, I can't do it. I can't go there. No, no. <laughs> Biggest worrier. Pardon? Biggest worrier. Sam, most definitely. I, I try to take things in, in my stride, um, logically think through problems that I've got and the majority of them you can sort of you can transcend or otherwise put to bed mm. some things are always with you of course but yeah Sam Sam is much more of a worrier I like that yeah yeah that's a good good approach and the last one deep down who do you think is the happiest person wow ah, that's a really interesting one I mean I feel very happy in my in my life and certainly Sam is is, is very happy with his lot I've got to say, I'd say both, mm-hmm. to mm. be fair. I love that. Yeah. Great. Uh, one of the last bits then is we have got a few listeners that have re- uh, wrote into us about uh, their questions. Okay. Um, so we're just going to do a few of these quick fire. Um, cool. So the first one is from Grace Riley. Shout out to Grace. She's also an actress. Um, okay. And she says, do you have aspirations to do lots of more challenging roles? Or should we say be challenged by different roles in mm. the future? And... She also asked, if a new producer came in and decided to write some out tomorrow, how would you feel about that at this stage? And do you have a plan in place for life beyond Emmerdale should that day come? Wow, that's quite a multi sort of... That, that, that question, was a lot of it? lines that yeah. I had to read. Thanks that's for that, Grace. That's a really <laughs> good question as well. Um, I mean, to answer the bit about if... I mean, that that is always a concern for any long-standing actor in a soap. Mm. We were talking off camera before about... Um, we're only on 12 month contracts at a time. So yeah, yeah. we could, in, in essence, be released at any time. Um, and I would be gutted if I wasn't in the show anymore. I'm, I've had a real renaissance period with the show because I, I, you know, I hated my job for a while and I, you know, I had a lot of things to work out in my brain and I got through those, worked them out, looked at my job and thought, this is one of the best jobs in the bloody world. But yeah. it's definitely the best job for me because yeah. I'm afforded a lot of time off. So mm. I've got time with my family, free time to go and climb or, you know, do what I want to do, read a book or listen to podcasts such as this. Yeah. Listen to uh, what, James? <laughs> <laughs> um, so that, and we were talking about time earlier. It's the one commodity that is limited. Yeah. You know, yeah. we've got a certain amount of time. So, yeah, this, this job for me is great. So if it ended tomorrow, I'd be absolutely devastated. Um so I hope to touch wood. So, mm. no, that's definitely wood. That wood, um, yeah. You got someone. Uh, uh, but the thing she says there about being challenged by different roles, it sounds like yes, you've done a lot that was of another part. A lot of the question, wasn't it? Other yeah. work alongside Emma Dale. I as have, well, yeah. I mean, I, I, I started out professionally when I was thirteen. Mm. So I did kids programs and um, I've worked in theatre a fair amount and I've done films, TV, um, and I've left the show a couple of times and come back to it. And yeah, I've always come back because. The environment on Emmerdale was better than the environment on a film set because yeah, there was such amazing. a pronounced hierarchy on a lot of film right. sets. Yeah, I found it difficult to get on with. I want to be in an ensemble where we're all working together mm. to create something. I don't mm. want to feel like my position is is a lower status than someone else and higher than others. Of course, you know, I think, and you know, it isn't without any fair. one of that that them people. Absolutely, that There's is no it's sure. absolutely true. Yeah, yeah. but so, you know, in in acting more than in a lot of industries. Some people get carried away with their own egos. Of course. That's something yeah. that, that Robbie touched upon in his first episode. Mm. He, he said that the most successful team that he's been in yeah. had a very flat organisation, so nobody was above anybody. There were, yeah. there, were cool. some, so there were some big characters, yeah. but nobody thought they were better than anybody else. It's a great and they were, the, they to were have. the most successful team. Mm. And Absolutely. That's, that's the key ingredient, isn't yeah. it? So it always led you back. It's a constituent part. Yeah, yeah. I, I've knocked on the door and, you know. They say never go back. I, mm. I disagree with that mm. idea or that, that philosophy um, because going back to Emmerdale has proved very f- f- fruitful and, you know, it's been a long career. It's afforded me a family life that mm. I absolutely love. Mm. But having said that, there's other things I want to do and I, there's, I would probably try and do things alongside doing yeah. Emmerdale. That's, that's the dream, isn't it? If you it can, is. If and you this is one of the things of I was so impressed with you two about is the fact that you've got jobs outside of your podcasts and everything that you do here mm, yeah but you're putting time and energy into getting a new venture going and i think it is a fabulous thing to do i've more power to you for doing it and it's something you know i've got loads of ideas to do things myself but the proof of the pudding is in the eating you've got to get up and do it and yeah. that's i respect you guys for 
you get you've got up and you're doing this thing mm. and you're going to make a success of it it's already a success it's written in the title rich in success i like it <laughs> but you. yeah so th there's things i want to do with my life and career alongside emmerdale hopefully and you mm. know i I, I endeavour to try and find a time when those things come to fruition. It is, yeah. we, we always say that it's about taking the action, isn't it? We all have it great is. ideas. We can yeah. all have a drink. Oh, I'm going to do this, that and the other. But then, you know, what do you actually do? I love that yeah. you was in a play with Jane as well before you even did Emmerdale. That, yeah. that's a bit, did you, is there any photos, videos? Is, is that there out will there? Be, yeah, there's be photos. I need to see that. That's that. such a cool thing. <clears throat> yeah, it was a, a play written by Richard Cameron, fantastic Northern writer. Yeah. Um, it was at the Bush Theatre, 1994. It was called The Mortal Ash. Oh, that's so cool. Let's let's yeah. get on that. We've, yeah. got to, we've got to dig it out. Next question. Uh, shout out to Lucy Fraser. Uh, if you could be a superhero, who would it be and why? Superhero. I like that question. Oh, dear. Random. I don't know. I'm not, not good with these sort of questions. I, I think, think I'd be Batman. Yeah. It's got to be Spider-Man. You climb. Spider, yeah, Spider-Man, Spider yeah. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. That sounds about right, yeah. <laughs> You're a climber. Yeah. It's got to be that, hasn't it? I did make it into the papers once for climbing up the front of a bar in Tenerife, absolutely steaming in sandals. <laughs> it's not a good thing to do. Please do not do <laughs> things like that. It's not acceptable behaviour. But yeah. But then again, but you you're still climb, here. You've got an experience you've learned from. Still, I'm still <laughs> and we, here, and yeah. we laughed at your story. Yeah. You brought us joy, <laughs> yeah. so everyone's a winner. Yeah. But seriously, don't don't do that. Please don't. <laughs> do not do things like that. It's ridiculous. Uh, next one is from Jessica McCoy and Jason Broadbent. They have asked, what uh, what made you go into acting, and why have you been so loyal to Emmerdale all these years? I feel like you've kind of you've kind, kind of, of answered, answered that. that yeah. But I mean, I can, I can go over the, the, the why reason. you got into it. Um, I was 10 years old, um, I was a bit of a, you know, uh, silly at school, in ju junior school, uh, I, I played in the school football team and we used to do school plays all the time, Mrs Brown, my old school teacher, fourth year juniors, so that, what would that be, year six now that would be, Okay. Um, she was doing Oliver Twist and she asked people if they wanted to audition for it and I stuck my hand up and said I want to sing a, you know she's got to sing a song I'll, I'll sing for the part of Fagin yeah and um, she looked at me like that what are you putting your hand up for sung, sung the solo She anyway she, long story short she gave me the part I buzzed off it and the, the production went really well and we even took the show up to the senior school mm. and did a, a performance up there in the, their theatre as well which mm. was just great and that gave me the bug for acting was it because Fagin's such a good character was it that Taking could have on been any, such a different... I, I don't know what it was. It could have been any character, I think. It was mm. just the fact that it was not a conscious decision. Right, okay. Was, I, I just... Yeah, I thought, yeah, I'd, I'll have a, I want to have a go at that. Love that. And Again, lessons I, to be learned then about just trying why, it. But this is, yeah, but the, as, a, as a kid, you try anything, don't yeah. you? You know, you do... You, and we, I think we lose part of that when we become, become adults and we become mm. stultified by the demands put on us by society. And it's, yeah, for sure. it's important to try and always pursue the things that you enjoy sometimes we don't have the ability to do it to the extent we would like but mm. you try and do it as much as you can pursue enjoyment in your life because it's enriching for mm. you. so yeah I, I pursued that thing that I wanted to pursue and it's been with me ever since I've always wanted to act since so yeah. I pursued it through senior school and then I got, I got a break to do a professional play when I was 13 at the Nottingham Playhouse um, which was Saturday night, Sunday morning, Nottingham writer Alan Silito did that. And then I did my first TV job shortly after and mm. just went with it all the way. I love that. And Excellent. there's something that really excites me about that idea of taking what, what excites you as a child and, and eventually that becomes what you do and what yeah. you get paid to do in your career. And I think yeah, yeah. that's really important for everybody. Go it's back to what the real... If you can, if you, if you can find that, yeah. you know... Um, Lots of people get through school, college, university, not knowing what they mm. what they want to pursue mm. afterwards. Yeah, and your your life's you know you can, you can go whichever direction you want if you put the the effort, the perseverance, so and true, yeah, the yeah. energy into going that and the, way. And there's yeah. never been a better time with the internet. With everybody's got a mobile phone, there's opportunities. Yeah. There's opportunities everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. everywhere yeah. Any question you've got, type it in a little thing called Google. There's a, yeah. a number of answers, and I think people get so used to that traditional way of getting a job and it's a job it's yeah. it's not it's not fun it's something you do to get paid to provide but and I think the, you don't the education need system has got a lot to answer for and it's not yeah i it's agree not fulfilling its mm. its remit it's not bringing the best out of 
everybody that goes it's through that conditioning. forced procedure. It's conditioning, isn't it's it? It's mind conditioning, yeah. if you ask me. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, He's trying uh, to get it, everybody a, ready for... Stay in line. Yeah, Staying in line, yeah. There's, there's a guy called John Taylor Gatto, who's, who's a state school educator in, in, in uh, America, who's an award-winning um, educator in an in, inner city school in uh, Manhattan. And he used to... Uh, he, well, he, he ended up leaving his profession because he, he felt that he could not... Um, ruin people's lives any further mm. and I mean he'd done a lot of good in education but he, he went and um, researched the history of education in America and wrote a book on it called An Underground History of American Education I think that's what it's called something like that John Taylor Gatto An Underground History of American Education I think that's we'll, what we'll it is we'll figure it out and we'll put it in the show notes okay. if anyone wants to but, find it and he talks about the, the western model of education is in essence, a Prussian model of outcome-based education to create a com- compliant workforce. And I couldn't agree more with his yeah. findings. Yeah, wow. Yeah. yeah. There you go. Listen, James, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much. I know Pleasure's that we could get mine. you on another three or four times and find so much more oh, mate, interesting sorry, I just stuff. Talk, I just chat nonsense. When we talk, even but... the stuff we've said, you know, off camera, like we, I know there's so much more we could yeah. we could talk about yeah. and there's so much value. So maybe at, at some point, if you'd be willing, we'll get you back I'd on the show. I'd come back, mate. We'll yeah, it. I'd come back every week if you'd have me. You know, <laughs> uh, no, yeah, I'd, I'd, be, I'd love to come back. Yeah, it'd be awesome. If well, if people want to keep up to date with you and find out more, where's the best sort of social media platforms you sort of... Um, I have a presence on Twitter, it's uh, and I'm on I'm on Facebook, but that's generally for my fam- family and friends yeah. on Facebook. So yeah. Twitter, you know, um, head over there. there. Do you yeah. know what the handle is off off top of at Jam Hoot? Love that Jam Hoot. Yes. Check him out to keep up to date with what James is up to. Okay. A massive thank you from us, Dan. Yeah. Do you want to ask the final question, James? What is your definition of success? That is. A fantastically difficult question to ask. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but a wonderful one. It's a wonderful question. Um, I think that um, pursuing a positive destiny and go, there's, there's, a, there's a phrase that springs to mind. It's like, go, go out into the world and do well, but go out into the world and do good. And that is a bit of a philosophy of life for, for me. I don't always do good. I don't always do well, but I keep trying to do that. Um, and if you keep trying to do that, that's success enough for me is that yeah. you're trying to do well and do good yeah. at the same time. So Wow. That is brilliant. James Hewitt, thank you. Thank you thank so you. much. Boys, thanks thank very you. much. Yeah. Round of applause. Woo, woo, woo. Yes. All, all the crew going. Close to you. Yeah. <laughs> just, just Ash. And Ash. Ash. Woo. James, thank you. Thanks Cheers, so boys. Thank you so much for listening to today's Rich in Success episode. If this episode has impacted you, there's a few things we need you to do to help support the show right now. Please spread the word. Tell a friend that you think needs to hear our message and subscribe to us on iTunes, SoundCloud, Spotify, Stitcher or Google Play. And please give the show a five-star review. Don't forget to also like our social media pages and tag us on your Instagram stories. Your support means the world. Thanks again and let's keep growing together.